Hi, I'm Andrew Nichols. 27 years ago this week, like you, I was at a student missions conference. I went with many of the same questions I'm sure you have. How can I make my life count? Should I become a missionary? I even cornered Dr. Ralph Winter, the great visionary who helped get Christians focused on unreached people groups. I said, should I go to the mission field? To my surprise, he said, it may be more strategic to be a sender than a goer. Later, as a member at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, I considered whether to become a pastor. At one point, our senior pastor, Mark Dever, introduced me to the theologian Carl Henry, and he mentioned that I was considering the pastorate. Without missing a beat, Dr. Henry said, avoid it if you can. Well, I realized that I had to make a decision. I decided based in part on the advice of Dr. Winter and Dr. Henry that I wouldn't go to seminary. I could have a ministry in my local church, maybe someday as an elder. I would opt out of paid ministry for now, knowing that God could turn me around any time. Since then, I've kept my bags packed emotionally, always ready to go if it became clear that I should go. In 1999, I got married to a woman who used to be on staff with the campus ministry and has always been open to missions, and we had four children. Two are in college, the other two are in high school. I worked in the U.S. Congress for seven years, went to law school, and have practiced law for the last 16 years. I was a partner in a large international law firm. Just this year, I moved to a small firm. My wife manages our home and recently took a job at our kids' school. I've served in many capacities in the church, including as an elder, and have helped plant a church. My wife and I continue to be open to being goers, but as far as we can tell, we're living fruitfully as senders. The question I want to address in the next few minutes is this, will I waste my life if I'm just a sender? The truth is, you might, and you might if you're a goer. You can waste your life anywhere. The mission field isn't a special realm where everything you do automatically matters for eternity. If you're careless, lazy, self-promoting, unethical, or a workaholic who wrecks your marriage, you can waste your life smack in the middle of an unreached people group. Going is no guarantee of faithfulness. In fact, a lifetime of reading the New Testament convinces me that God wants us to focus more on how we're working than on the geography of where we're working. Try this. Read through the New Testament and note every passage that talks about how to work and every one that talks about geographically where to work. If you do that, I think you'll conclude that geography may be the least important question you're facing. Not because God doesn't care about the nations, but because He's a great God. He can easily transplant an excellent worker from one place to another. He can move Martin Lloyd-Jones from a remote village in Wales to London. He can take Tim Keller from rural Virginia to New York City. And he can move people the other direction as well. Think of all the things that redirect the course of your life. A new marital status, a change in your health, a surprising opening, a switch in government policies, a global pandemic. Any of these things and so many more can turn senders into goers and goers into senders. And God sometimes waits to change things up. If you met Jesus when he was, say, 22 years old, you might have encouraged him not to work eight more years in the carpenter shop before preaching. I think we forget how shocked people were when Jesus changed jobs at age 30. He showed up in his hometown of Nazareth to preach and the people said, isn't this the carpenter? It's almost a comic scene. You look familiar, preacher. Didn't you sell me a dining room set? Or think about Moses as a young man. He tried to be a hero, really a vigilante. He wound up on the run as a murderer. By the time he was called, at age 80, he was done with heroics. He was quite content herding sheep, thank you very much. The point is, many of us will live through going and staying seasons. And the going seasons may come later than we think. So, with that in mind, let's talk about two biblical principles that will help us make the most of our lives as senders or for that matter, as goers. These are big concepts worth careful study. I'll just whet your appetite here. Number one, 
we're always working for Jesus. Genesis teaches us that God is a worker, and he made us to be workers. After God worked to create the world, he made us to work it and to keep it. Genesis tells us the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. He charged the man and his wife to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, God made us before the fall to work at making his creation flourish. As a result of the fall, we work for ourselves, by our own rules, for our own purposes. But Jesus frees us from working for ourselves. He redeems us to work for him, to make his world flourish, both physically and spiritually. The call of Christ, then, is not fundamentally a call to a new work, but to a new master. We're called away from master self to master Jesus. Now, I want to be clear. Obeying master Jesus might lead you to change your job, say, if your job is immoral or leads you to live in a way that's unfaithful to God. But the essence of Jesus' call isn't to change your job. It's to follow him in your job. Understanding this transforms how we work. It also transforms our understanding of what work is. It means work goes beyond our jobs. It's everything we do to make God's world flourish physically and spiritually. If we're students, it's our studies where we learn how to make God's world flourish. If we're in the marketplace, it's every task we do, every email we send, every meeting we hold, every person we help. When we work in unpaid roles as volunteers, or in the home, or in the church, every single thing we do is for Christ. How can I say that? Well, it's crystal clear in Scripture that there's never a time when we're not serving Christ, no matter the task at hand. Remember what Paul told the Colossian slaves? Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That's why he told the Corinthians, Each one of you should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned. In whatever condition you were called, there remain with God. You see his point, whatever our work may be, we do it for Jesus, with Jesus. This is why when I go into court, I write Jesus at the top of my notes to remind myself that above the judge or panel of judges stands the judge of all the earth, and he's my ultimate audience. The same will be true for you in your work now as a student or a recent graduate and also down the road, whether you go or stay. Nothing you do for Jesus is unspiritual. Whether you, whatever you do for him, paid or unpaid, in the marketplace, or the church, or the home, he promises to reward in eternity. So whatever you do, my sending friend, work heartily. Do it for Jesus with joy and excellence. As you do, delight in God, knowing that he too is working. In fact, as part of his work, he's prepared your good works in advance for you. Seeing Jesus as your boss will free you to say no to too much work in any sphere because you know he's given you other assignments. As my son put it, just as you wouldn't turn in one beautiful project at work while ignoring two other ones, you shouldn't strive for excellence in your job to the exclusion of other God-given responsibilities. Exactly right. But what are those other responsibilities? Here, we need to turn to our second principle and talk about the biblical concept of the household. And for this point, I'll hand the uh, video to my wife, Barry. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but the basic working in unit in scripture isn't an individual. It's a corporate enterprise, a married couple. Now I know most of you are probably single, but hang in there and we'll get to singleness. Let's start with marriage because that's where the Bible starts. Remember in Genesis, God gave Adam work to do, fill and subdue the earth. But Adam couldn't do it alone. In fact, God said Adam's aloneness was not good. But you know, that's exactly how we tend to think of ourselves as workers. Solitary people toiling from nine to five or eight to six or whatever your schedule may be, 
were Adam or Eve alone in the garden. Friends, this is not a biblical vision of ourselves as workers. God says it is not good. Now, this isn't the time or the place to go into roles in marriage, but simply to recognize that marriage is not separate from or in competition with our work. In fact, it was designed to enable and define the work. The married couple forms a household, which according to scripture is the enterprise through which we accomplish our work of filling and subduing the earth. The married couple household is not only the vehicle for accomplishing the work, it's a model of Christ and the church. And when it's rounded out with children, it's a model of all the various redeemed relationships in the church where still more good works are done. And that's why both Paul and Peter call the church itself God's household. It's why Paul tells Timothy to treat older men as fathers, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters. The Christian household is, as the Puritans called it, a miniature church. So stepping back, what we see is that scripture defines human households together with God's household as interlocking contexts where we work for our new master. No matter what our day job may be, we're always working as members of our human household and of the household of God. In other words, biblically, job, family, and church are integrated. Not that there's never friction between these spheres, but our work in one sphere tends to benefit our work in others because we serve one master who designed each sphere and assigned us our work in each. Let me illustrate. When Andrew was an elder, on Sunday he would often teach at church, explaining Bible texts. On weekdays, he explained legal texts to clients and judges. And at night, he'd come home and talk with us, our family, about scripture texts. So it was text, text, text. No matter where he was working, he was always cross-training and growing in his skills. I find the same to be true in my work. I use the same skills to manage our household as I do in my job at the kids' school. I disciple our children as I seek to disciple younger women in the church. I show hospitality to those in paid ministry and to non-Christian friends. This will look different for each of us, but there will always be overlap between the spheres of our lives, relating to people, leading people, submitting to people, helping people. God does not waste our work in any of our assignments. Now, none of this is to slight singleness. In fact, for those who can handle it with purity, the single person household is better than the married couple household. Paul writes, those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. I would like you to be free from concern. Now remember, this is the same guy who wrote Ephesians. He's the one who said that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. But here he's saying that if you can handle it, singleness is superior because it frees you from the burdens that come with a married couple household which are many. So if you want more freedom to work in the marketplace or church, and maybe especially if you wanna be a goer to a high risk area, the single person household may be better for you. Consider praying about that.